have a new face on Taking Care of Business this week. He is Christian Valdini and he is our Group Marketing Director at Allsop and Allsop. in the afternoon. So marketing's changed a hell of a lot. So Lewis, I think just very quickly before we start about marketing and what we're seeing today, let's talk about how we found it when we started. So 15 years ago, 2008. It's 15 years. Tell, tell um, us about marketing 2008. What does that look like? Just everything we like to do now, and you may disagree, Christian, we'll talk yep. about branding a little bit. Everything we do is measured on performance. Yep, 100%. I think the, the fact that we can now essentially hyper target people at key moments with our brand when we think it's relevant to them in order to try and persuade or influence them to buy or use our service. Yep. We have a new face on Taking Care of Business this week. He is Christian Valdini and he is our Group Marketing Director at Allsop and Allsop. Welcome aboard. Indeed. Thanks for having me, guys. And we've got a familiar face who's rejoined us, the CEO, Lewis Allsop. I nearly didn't make it today due to my tiredness. <laughs> He's very tired. He stayed up watching Coventry City last night until And we drew nil nil, so it was really, <laughs> it was really worth staying up till 2am. Really worthwhile. So what we're here today to talk about on Taking Care of Business, this week's episode is all about marketing and how real estate marketing has changed, certainly over our time in business, nearly 15 years. And Christian is here today to share, to share with us some of the trends that we're seeing today. We're not very trendy people. Oh, so you I, I wouldn't say that. I think that there's definitely been a, a lot of developments in the real estate market that, that you guys have been pretty much at the, the forefront of, and that was kind of one of the, the times when um, what got me into sort of speaking with you guys in the first place. I was really impressed with some of the marketing that you guys were doing yeah. out there for not just real estate in particular, but just to, from the industry as a whole, sort of coming from a, an agency background, you guys have been doing really decent quality marketing across the board. Why, thank you. Well, I'll take the compliment <laughs> at uh, 20 past 12 in the afternoon. So marketing's changed a hell of a lot. So Lewis, I think just very quickly before we start about marketing and what we're seeing today. Let's talk about how we found it when we started. So 15 years ago, 2008. Is it's 15 years. Tell, tell oh us about God. marketing 2008. What does that look like? So marketing's always been a, a, a big part of my real estate career. I honestly believe that marketing should never be classed as a cost. I've always said this and the accountants will argue with us. They always have for, they for the last 15 years. Marketing should be a revenue stream and you should be able to multiply the marketing in terms of how much you spend to be able to reverse that to how much you're making. But if you look at what we've done over the last 15 years, I think about when we first launched All Stop and All Stop, the first thing we did back in them days is we signed a year contract with Gulf News and we were paying to be on the front page in the middle of the property section. There was no debizzle, no property finder, no houser. I don't think we had a website because it wasn't really a thing. We were sending out contracts via fax machine. Yeah. And I suppose when you look at the visibility side of it, and let's just take away the old school versus new school, just talk about visibility on its own. We were so much less visible, so much, because you're relying on one person opening the paper, reading that, and then actually contacting you. Well, it was where the eyeballs in 2008, and correct me if I'm wrong, Christy, maybe you can tell me, was Facebook even a thing then? MySpace. Or even if it was, it was very early stages. It was super early stages by then. I remember when it first came into the market, just across the board, when you could actually set up groups and target people at mass, and all of a sudden people were like, hang on a minute, I can now reach all of these different people at the same time with my marketing campaigns. Whereas in the past, it would have been either email-based, direct sort of one-to-one -one yeah. marketing, or as you said, the old school, old school traditional media, yeah. newspaper, print ads, if you've been particularly flush, you might have had a radio ad to Ooh, get a bit more yeah. of that reach if you were feeling you've had a good couple of months. Yeah, sounds good. And I'm then obviously that. you've got the, the large scale formats, which would really only be for the big companies, your billboards and your TV. Well, our, our focus when we launched, and believe it or not, when was the last time you, you two bought a newspaper? I would still, if I was on holiday, I'd still like the sun delivered to my doorstep if I could get it. <laughs> Love the sun. So we, our primary focus of advertising was newspapers, which was the Gulf News. It was an absolute fortune. And what was crazy is actually the 2008 recession, 2009, and obviously the, the emergence of, of social media really, for me, for certainly advertising on, uh, in newspapers, kind of within two, three years, it went away, didn't it? Yeah, but I think the, the big thing is well, the cost of printing a newspaper, forget the cost we were spending. I remember when we were spending, and it said the time, we were spending 20,000 pounds or 100,000 dirhams a month as a startup business just mm -hmm. to be in the action. 
Um, and the reason for that is obviously the print of the paper and the ink that comes. But think about how much money we used to spend on ink in this company whenever we used to print all the documents. The cost of running a paper ended up costing the customer, i.e. the spenders, a lot of money compared to the digital world. So to be honest with you, I'm happy the papers have gone. But what I will say is that there is still a market there for it. I think that, um, and we're talking a limited market, but things like the aeroplanes and uh, product placement in certain locations where there's the type of clientele that you're looking for, that could be as basic as a flyer going to a certain client. It's it's there's still a market there but it's very diluted compared to today's digital world what we don't like about print advertising look it served us well in the early early days and one thing i don't miss is having to rush to get an advert up ready on a monday afternoon to be ready to go for, for wednesday's print and all, all that sort of thing but one thing we, we which we didn't like is you couldn't measure results mm. which is why in today's marketing now lewis talked about it at the, start of the phone uh, start of the, the podcast was everything we like to do now, and you may disagree, Christine, we'll talk yep. about Brandon a little bit, mm-hmm. everything we do is measured on performance. Yep, 100%. I think uh, the fact that we can now essentially hyper-target people at key moments with our brand when we think it's relevant to them in order to try and persuade or influence them to buy or use our service yep. is incredible. Like it's uh, The fact that we can do is so we can switch on and off. You're only paying for the stuff that people see or click on at some times. Yep. So the value that you can get from it is massive. There's, I, there's no denying. For that. anybody listening to the podcast, who want to understand what hyper target means in real estate. I'm going to try and give you a very basic snapshot. If you live in Dubai Marina, we are able to drop a pin location within one kilometer of where you live. We're able to pick your age, your nationality, your interests, what gender you are. So hypothetically, I use this as a perfect example. My wife, um, about three years ago, four years ago, as a hobby was selling bikinis. So she was getting them off um, Alibaba. Yeah. And she said, oh, I really like the bikinis. So she wore them because I'm going to try and sell them. So she was buying them and she was just creating social media adverts for women between like 20 and 35, whatever the age was, in Dubai. And I said to George at one point, I was like, can you stop getting people's contacts? Queues of women were coming <laughs> and buying the bikinis. And I remember helping a packet and I said to her, I'm going to have to be the CEO soon, baby. You're going to leave me in charge. <laughs> and she did that single-handedly from hypertag. And so I think... The ability to target in real estate is the same. You can do area, location, interest. It's well, talking about what's changed in the last five years. Obviously, WhatsApp's been certainly this part of the world. It is a massive part of communicating. The one thing we've we've made a real conscious effort on it in the last fifteen years is lots of companies we work with, not necessarily real estate, but email is a massive, still a big focus of other companies. And what we haven't done over fifteen years is we haven't spammed people. I think we've you know make maintain a. Yeah. You know, good brand reputation, not just sending stuff out weekly or daily, every single day. The mm-hmm. stuff you get from us is it's original, it's informative, and um, it's a little bit different. Indeed, and I think that's kind of like one of the one of the keys is so how how do you reach people without essentially annoying them, pissing them off? Like nobody wants to receive about a hundred emails which have no relevance to yeah. them day in day out, but at the same time they want to be able to find what they're looking for at the exact moment when they need it. Yeah. So our, our role in what, what we obviously do quite well, very well, around the performance side, around if anyone's going in to search for Dubai real estate, apartments in the marina, investments in XYZ, we will rank highly on it. And I think it's like having that ability is kind of ticking one box. You're physically available for them when they need you. Yeah. And that's what we talk about, sort of like the, the short term sort of marketing that we look at the performance marketing. Now that's great and that's like that's essential for all brands do you think brand marketing because I, I give you my opinion on this mm-hmm. so this goes back to 2008 when we launched the business we were offered so many times banners and things like that on websites which effectively banner for anyone that's not tech savvy is at the top you could pay for the top bit to say your brand and your logo and I always rejected it because my life was always based on performance marketing mm-hmm. now brand marketing where does that sit for a company who is semi-established and generating revenue. Do you think brand revenue is a, 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 a similar look at brand recognition or? Uh, yeah, hugely. I'm a big believer in the, the branding, sort of the brand effects, if yeah. you like. In terms of, as we sort of just talking about there, in terms of short-term, almost like activational marketing. So how do we get people that are in market now yeah. to be aware of our products and services and buy them? Performance yeah. takes care of that. It makes sure that our brand's in front of the right people at the right time. But if you think on a longer term, what do we want to be? We don't just want to be the brand that people search for and find. We want to be the brand that people think about before they even search. Yeah. I'll ask you like now, so you want to buy a new mobile phone or a laptop, what are you thinking? 
Apple. Ah, correct. I'm thinking about a new pair of trainers. I'm already Nike. I'm not searching for yeah. people that provide phones or laptops. But what, do you, what okay, so this gets a little bit deep into the marketing then. So Adidas are a good brand company. They've got yep. great sponsors behind them. You've got other companies out there. What is it, well, let's use, use uh, as Nike as an example for you. Yep. Is it Nike or Adidas? Nike for me. You've got Adidas trainers on. got that. Adidas today. <laughs> <That's> the, <laughs> but but Nike, Nike is a great, great example because what Nike done with their, sh their, their, their shoes was they got Michael Jordan. Yeah. They got, was, was, was uh, Tiger Woods. Yeah. And they were the brand. an extension of the brand and people were drawn to it. So but what, that's what I was, was going to get into. Do you think the big thing is not the logo, it's, do you think it's how can they associate to your brand? What is it that you think the, the brand recognition, the people brand does? Yeah, I think it's, it's quite like the, in the easiest form, people buy people, Yeah, essentially. Yeah. They trust people, they buy people. So people are essentially becoming the brands, yeah. what, whether that's a brand ambassador in sports, yeah. whether it's yourself as a real estate influencer. Stop in it, stop <laughs> it. I don't want to blue talk about tics, that. Blue ticks, everybody. Yeah, pe people trust people. I do have a blue tick, by the way. You've got it. Like, they said, like a prime example recently, over Christmas, the whole Logan Paul and KSI thing yeah. with their prime energy drink. You guys know this as, as parents, you know this more than, than anyone, the effect that that had, and that was people. Buying. What they've done, by the way, so I don't know if anyone's seen what Logan Paul KSI, who are two social media influencers, is insane. So went back at Christmas, talked about it off camera. Uh, a friend of ours, basically one of their children, asked for prime energy drinks for Christmas. That just goes to show how important in influencers or individuals supporting a brand plays a huge part in promoting that product. And yeah. you looking at online a moment ago, how much, how much can you buy a pack of four prime energy drinks today on delivery? It's 350 dirhams, which is $100, $100 for four sports drinks. $25 a drink. It's mad. It's just mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, you've got to consider, if you look at KSI and Logan Paul that have, have launched um, prime drinks, they launched it a year ago. They announced it, I think three months at $250 million in sales. That makes them at the level of Gatorade, which is just mad. Gatorade yeah. is the, probably the biggest sports drink around. I mean, you're going back to the Adam Sandler film when he was in the, um, the what's the NFL film? Where was it um, Adam oh, Sandler? Water boy, water boy. And they were talking yeah. about 20 years ago, yeah. Gatorade. Then I, I, I remember the conversation. And it, go, it begs the question, you look at the big brands like Apple and Nike now, they don't spend that much money on TV. Their money's actually pumped into social media and p people like Roy McElroy and tiger woods and these people and if you going back to how easy it is to share marketing now if you get a viral video i seen one last week with tiger woods and um roy mcelroy and they put this is the best advert ever created from nike and it's rory and then you and they went okay let's hit a, a target 300 yards away and they hit it 500 yards where they hit somebody somebody's window and they both hit the window they put it in the dog bowl they put, and, they, and yeah. they're having a competition who could do it they're two of the biggest people the minute that goes on social media what do we share to each other every day? <laughs> Wrestling videos. It's ridiculous. <laughs> 1990s videos, me and Carl share, like The Undertaker, like chokeslam on someone off the roof. But we would never share that on the paper. It's so easy in today's world to share something that you're interested in to your friends worldwide. Just moving on a little bit. So our big focus in our business today is data. We love data. Yep. We're a bit geeky with stuff like that. How does that change our marketing angle with data? Because you kind of, Data and marketing aren't particularly sexy. You don't, you don't see them go hand, hand in hand. So how does that play a part in our... Um, well, I think when we're marketing, like, essentially, as, as we always associate marketing with like creative, fluffy stuff, non-trackable. Yep. But uh, sort of like, where it should be really is, is it effective? What, what are we doing? Is it having an, an input on our bottom line? Is it having a put input on our brand awareness, our reach? So the numbers come into play quite a lot. So in terms of like now when we think about the content that we create, why is that relevant to the people that we're trying to target? What yeah. value are we adding in exchange for their attention? And that's kind of where we're getting at between this sort of brand attention and do, value. Do you know what I see and why we're doing data? So the emotional side of it, our advertising could be an individual, could be showing someone a property, should be, could be painting a picture about what it could be like living in that property. The data is the justification. It's about why someone should buy it and the reasons behind it. And yep. I think a lot of people need that, justifying, do I need this? Why do I need this? And is it the right thing? Because people need to be also know, am I doing the right thing? Yep. And the data support that. 
kind of guides people, yes, you're doing the right thing. Well, I think so, because it was all essentially data transparency. There used to be a time when people kept data to themselves. That was kind of their secret source that they had. That gave you a competitive advantage. I think now fast forward to the point when everybody can access data all over the place. Now it's about how can you share the right data at the right time to help people basically make better informed decisions. In our case about property. Yeah. Is it about the market? Is it in case where trends are? Where's the next up and coming place? We want to make that data readily available to people so that when they do come to the point when they want to invest or buy a property or rent a property, they think of us first because we were the ones that gave them the helping hand. We weren't asking for anything back. We weren't charging for the service. We were just offering value. And if you take that right the way down from the the monthly reports, the market trends that we put together, right the way down to our sales agents in individual communities, they're there 24 seven working around these communities, offering people advice, becoming known as the face, the trusted face yeah. in that area. And I think you can't really put a price on how valuable it is that people are trusted in an area to give advice, even if it's not gonna generate a sale straight away. In the long tail, and this is about that brand, it will start to build if you do this consistently over time. This is where, we again, we touched on Logan Paul and KSI. I believe people don't follow brands. I think it's people first and then the brand. And I think the person is actually the brand in most businesses. You look at Apple, Apple was Steve Jobs, let's just say how yeah, yeah, it's probably yeah. still remembered. Tesla is Elon uh, Musk. Elon Musk. Yeah. You could pick any business, Microsoft, yeah. it's Bill Gates. Okay. Like, and you could do that across most businesses that are not legacy businesses. I'm not talking like Jaguar that's handed over years or Land Rover, you couldn't answer them, but most of the most popular businesses are a, a, a brand and a face. So businesses that I look at and we're talking about before is Aviation Gin. So Aviation Gin was launched about two years ago by Ryan Reynolds. Yep. Ryan Reynolds obviously did Deadpool. Yep. He's done the Wrexham documentary with- um, Rob McElhenney. Rob McElhenney. He's really good friends with the guy from Wolverine. What's his name? That promotes Hugh Jackman. Jackman. So Hugh yep. Jackman's constantly drinking uh, the drink and you know now that is already competing. Then you look at Proper 12, which is Conor McGregor's whiskey. Yep. So Conor McGregor's whiskey it's probably not the best whiskey in the market, but if you look at his followers today, I don't know how you can check how many followers he's got. He must have 50, 60, 70 million followers. You probably get that on the Super Bowl for someone to watch and watch the advert. They instantly, from Conor McGregor, he launched the Apple one, did you see? He just launched yeah, the yeah, Apple yeah. whiskey. Yeah. Oh, we've got the Apple whiskey and he's doing it, talking it. That's gone to all his followers. They're not going, oh my God, that whiskey's really nice. What do you think they're really saying? Conor McGregor drinks this whiskey. Yeah. And then you go to Skims by Kim Kardashian. All the girls love Kim Kardashian. She's obviously edited, whatever has to look absolutely incredible. Um, they launch Skims, it'll make you skinnier. They're not going, oh, Skims is great. They're saying, who's wearing it? Yeah, It's Kim Kardashian. And that's why I think brand is probably the person first and brand and the logo second in today's Who, world. Me and you've got a big problem then. Massive issue. <laughs> if it comes to brand, massive issue, yeah. Who wants to follow and buy anything off us? Yeah. Here's my children, and I might put on there some real estate news once in a while. <laughs> I, think, I think now, just that, that time frame um, to market now, as we said with the KSI example, mm. it used to be that you used to have to spend a number of years consistently slogging away of like awareness, awareness, awareness to build a brand that yeah. people trusted. Nowadays, you can have a brand that goes viral on social, gets picked up, reshared, amplified by 100%. everyone. And the timeline to get to market is ridiculous. The KSI example with the prime drink, a PepsiCo would take two, three years of testing the product back yeah. and forwards, focus groups, test groups. Millions and eventually millions. it would come out and it would be okay and they'd probably sleep on it and yeah. nothing would happen. The fact that these guys came out of an energy drink, just wrapped it in a brand, put it online and it flew, just says everything you need to know. And no one's tasted it. They're just going Logan exactly. Paul and KSI, which the cleverest bit about it, this goes back to cross fertilization of marketing, is that KSI is the UK, isn't he? Yeah. Logan's America. They've crossed both synergies together. And it's a bit like us doing a podcast. If we wanted to really break into, and this is just some examples, someone in business wants to you know, potentially generate more followers. We did a podcast today with somebody in recruitment at our level we would be known in the recruitment sector for whatever we're doing or the tech sector. You bring them on, they've got their own following and they're following shared with you and that's exactly what KSI has done. So very clever. I do believe people buy the people. Indeed. So you've been with us since November. Yep. What's it like being here, building a new and improved in-house marketing agency? Um, I think it's, 
the difference between working with a, an in-house agency, one that you can actually shape versus working for an agency, is that traditionally I would have worked for an agency and we'd have had the likes of Allsop as a client. Yep. You'd have come back to us with your requests. The time to process these respond was so slow than yeah. other times. The difference now is an example, we have a, a team of six, seven, eight photo videographers. If we have a content idea, we can think of it in the morning, we can shoot it in the afternoon, edit it and out by the end of the day. Yeah. The speed to market that we can get out with content is scary. It would have, though, I think I mentioned in a post the other day, the amount of content we put out last week alone with property agent tours, valuations, podcasts, catch up with cash. How, how many eyeballs do you reckon was on that content that week? Uh, it's, it's frightening to even think about what it would be, but traditionally, a brand, a client brand, mm. would have taken two weeks to plan the photo, the video shoots. Yeah. Then we'd have gone and shot it. It would have taken four rounds of editing back and forth. It would have taken us, at a push, I reckon we could have got it, a video shoot out in two weeks. By which wow. stage it's old news and it's gone. I think the speed in which and you wouldn't have to negotiate with me on prices. Exactly. Oh, can you imagine that? Imagine having oh. to deal with Carl every week on prices. <laughs> Do you know one of the shoot? one of the most interesting things that I've seen for our, our marketing team? And again, this is just ideas for anybody in business watching this. Is we've moved away from the heavy lifting cameras, haven't we? For yeah. on site, talk a little bit about that and why what we're doing. Yeah. So sort of traditionally, you'd have your your digital full production DSLR cameras, which were great if you were shooting long form content. It was going on YouTube. It was an ad being viewed on a big screen on TV. 80% of our eyeballs on a mobile phone. Yep. And not just that, it's often in vertical full screen format. Even if you shoot it on the big cameras, you can still crop it, don't get me wrong, to, yep. to fit the format. But with the likes of like your, your, your iPhone Pro Maxes these days, some of the top line Samsungs, you can shoot broadcast quality content yeah. from a handset. You add a, a gimbal and some good lighting and sound, and you can basically point and shoot. You can, Mad, isn't it? You can point it, shoot it, edit it the same day, and get it straight out there. So I remember when we were hiring videographers, I mean, this is only about two years ago, and we were looking at thinking, oh my God, we're hiring a new person. You need a 30,000 dim camera to get going. Now we're talking about the quality that Apple has got to in Samsung and Google. Three and a half, four thousand 4,000 per camera. You can have 10 people out shooting consistently, yeah. and then obviously placing that onto social media. So it's really interesting to watch. I mean, this is being filmed today on these DSLRs, aren't they, effectively? Yeah. But I don't doubt at some point, and again, just understanding technology, I simply thought we could do our next podcast with a live stream on LinkedIn 100%. from the mobile yeah, and your yeah. chats on here. That's the technology difference between the old school versus the new school. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. So, not too far off wrapping up. Five years time. Yep. Dead. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> Rest in peace. Yeah. Five years time, what, will, what differences do you think we will see in marketing? I've got my view, but what do you think? Um, for me, I think there's going to be this kind of, there's almost like a, you can almost see it at the moment. There's this pushback about sort of everyone sort of just spending so much on performance marketing and sort of where I come from, it's this, how do you start to build the brand? If you think on average, just going through your day, going to work on your phone in the evening, you see between 4,000 to 10,000 ads or brands every day. You can only recall maybe 1% of those at max. But I think like your, your brain's like a computer with a hard drive. It can only take so much in. Yeah. So you can only recall maybe 1% of what you see during the day. And so if things aren't of any interest to you or don't really scream out to you to add value. You just like, the brands aren't being noticed. So I think yeah. the, the role of content being hyper relevant in terms of the, the people that are giving the advice, as you said, it's the people behind the brands will start to come forward. So I think when we look at some of the great US real estate brands, the likes of Sirhan and Surfalls, yeah. some of their, their agents, their mini celebrities in their own rights, they put their own spin on selling property, the stories they tell. You buy that person, you buy what they're telling you. Do you know what's crazy with these companies like Sirhan and who's the guy that's just come over from America? Um, the brothers, the old brothers, if you yes. that. Allsop and Allsop is legitimately bigger than yeah. all these companies, legitimately bigger. But because they've been on TV, and people follow them like they'll get invited to go and speak in shows and things yeah. like this because people are following Ryan Sohan as an example or they're following but also but also we don't really push main in Carl's brand we just don't yeah. we, you know we've been offered to go on I've been offered to go on a Netflix program I've been offered to go on Channel 4 in the UK I've been offered to BBC we've actually green screen one and turn it down in the end because we believe our business model comes first over the the, the social media brand aspect of it but it is crazy to think that if you do have a brand forget 
your turnover becomes irrelevant. You end up getting opportunities from being a person rather than going, actually, this company is the biggest selling company. We'll go, they're known. And that's mad, but that's how it is. Let me tell you my view. Five years' time, so I think the world would be a little bit different. I think in five years, you'll start to see, start to see the difference in how ads are served. So at the minute, everything's on our phones, right? Or on our computers. In five years' time, you're probably going to have different versions of AR or VR, yeah. or at least the very first version of some glasses or goggles, yeah. where probably ads will be served to you on your face. Yeah. The start of it. I don't think we're probably 10 years I've seen it maybe mainstream, but that's how I think maybe ads might be served or marketing might be served to you. Yeah. Yeah, Here, here's, here's the two biggest things that yeah. I think we'll take away from it. Here, I'm gonna make a massive statement here. Potentially, whoever gets the AI search right will be the number one search engine. So for instance, Bing. Mm-hmm. Never logged into Bing in 10 ever. years, ever <laughs> in my life. Yeah. I'm now starting to see how their AI search works. So they're how chat GBT is, things like that. Whoever pulls out the best search engine, all of a sudden paid ads sort of disappear. And that's how they monetize that. So I think Google is under a lot of pressure and stress at the moment with people like Microsoft, everyone has launched their own search engines. Whoever creates the best one, definitely move forward. However, I'm gonna leave you this thought. This is the last thought for where I think the world will be. Forget adverts. So wearables, are obviously Apple Watches years ago were laughed at thinking you're not gonna wear an Apple Watch. I wear my Apple Watch nine out of 10 days because of the steps, the calorie count, the heart rate, everything, the heat, everything you can get with it now. But where I think the world will go with the next phase is going back to wearables, going back to the glasses that you talked about. This is how mad I see it. And it's so doable right this second that it blow your mind. My goal, and I said to George, my wife, five years ago, I said, I would love to walk past somebody and know who they are. I'd love to know what job they do. I'd love to know how much money they earn. Yeah. So today, if you're logged in on your phone, and I've got my glasses on, and you're logged into your LinkedIn, I'll see your name. I will see your job. I will see what company it will, and it will come above your head. That technology is legitimately available now because you're logged into your account, and it's got GPS tracking for every single person. The world with the tech, could go in a different one. That's why I see it going mad. Right, to wrap up, we had a new, few new stories. So Dubai looks at 85 billion worth of prop tech boom coming into Dubai. So Dubai real estate firms are turning to innovate investment opportunities to the I-85 billion in prop tech. Prop tech companies are creating a strong footing in the UAE property market, startup ecosystems, government support. What do we think on prop tech? There's not enough in, in the UAE, in my opinion. Um, there seems to be a, a big focus on that. Thoughts on it? I don't think there's been any, and this is worldwide, by the way. People always talk about prop tech. Purple Bricks claim they're prop tech. They weren't prop tech. They were my account, effectively, mm-hmm. with a PPC campaign behind it. Um, there's companies over here now that have launched prop tech companies, but reality is they're lead generators that are put a certain way to, to mm-hmm. come across a certain point. There's not many companies that I've seen have revolutionized the technology to do so. And I think in the UA, the biggest problem is, is there's too many footholds to get over, like a bank, for instance. My perfect scenario for also of mortgage services is to be able to do your application online and to be able to say, how much do you earn? Okay, let's start the process. Everything done there, digital signatures. I push for the banks. The banks won't give you the open APIs and more importantly, they're going to digitally sign or send, accept everything unless it's signed. There are too many roadblocks in the way for real technology to take place in the UAE for the next few years until they overcome that. So I, unless you can tell me, do you know any legitimate? Well, I guess it's like you're, you're looking at sort of like two things. On one hand, we have the government that are pushing for smart cities of the future mm. going into the metaverse X, Y, Z. We've only just started taking direct debits for rent right. payments. So it's kind of, a, on, one <laughs> hand, on one hand, we're saying like, this is it, let's take us to the moon. Yeah. On the other hand, we're still just getting the basics right. P.S. We haven't got FaceTime or WhatsApp video call <laughs> in the UAE. Madness. So I think, yeah, until we get some of these, these basics really sort of hammered down to, say, to start talking about the stuff 20 or 30 years ahead is, is it's going to be difficult. We could get these glasses in. They could make sense. Will they be allowed to be used in this region? No. Arguably. Not, not so, a chance. Yeah. 10 billion worth of UA dirhams worth of property sales last week. It's a good week. <laughs> it's a good week. Badness. Uh, Dubai real estate transactions came in more than 10 billion according to the Dubai Land Department. Uh, there were a total of 3,200 transactions and there was 1 billion in mortgage transactions 
in Palm Jumeirah. 168 plots were sold, wow. 1.2 billion. And 2,000, 2,200 apartments were sold and villas were made up of 5.1 billion. I think suffice to say, it is extremely busy. It's trumped the rest of the world. We've had our record month in February. Um, so, you know, I think last February, we were like, how are we going to trump what we've done? But we've done it again. And it's not because our business is amazing. I believe everybody else in Dubai is doing amazing because the US, the UK, the uncertainties, the political uncertainties in other countries at the moment, people using Dubai as a haven, a safe haven to live here. So I think the next two years, Dubai genuinely has a very good interest. I mean, I went to go and see a project called Wanzabil. Uh, this morning, which is one with a cantilever over it. It's like two buildings joined together, one serviced by the one and only, one commercial. I mean, very expensive, beautiful project. I like the look. I went to the sales centre and uh, I got in there and they went, yeah, sorry, we sold the last four units yesterday to one person. Man. I'm like, wow, like that is legit. Like we're talking like super high end and that is the market at the moment. For the next three or four years, the money come trickling into Dubai is frightening. You know what's really interesting? I'll, I'll, I'll leave it on this. I got emailed a couple of weeks ago. I'm not gonna name who I got email about, but they were at, this person was asking feedback on what Dubai requires in the next couple of years. And I think it's so refreshing to be asked yeah. what Dubai requires. At government level as well. At government yeah. level it was. Um, so they're, I think they're very aware that there's a big focus on, on luxury at the moment. Yeah. I do believe there's got to be more investment and more property launches at entry level, yeah. you know, to convert that tenant into buyers. But it's yeah. great, to, it's great to hear that they're open to feedback, which is really, really If good. you're earning, let's say 20 to 30,000 dirhams a month at the moment, you're capped at about, because of the interest rate, it's about 1.5 million. Which trying to find a townhouse for a family you have to go further out, which is not a problem, but there's not many options. Yeah. You've either got one extreme, which is a Koya Oxygen, which is like a long way out where you can get it, but there's nothing in Dubai region that is the affordable living, because everything affordable has gone up in value. I'll talk about affordability in a little plug. Handover's happening this month, that I'm aware of, obviously there are more than what I'm talking about. Talawa Gaff, yep. handing over this month. So I personally think that'll be probably, if not one of all the best communities to buy that, handing over their townhouses. Are you saying that as an investor, because you own there, or are you saying that as a- <laughs> I'm as saying a, as a general. Yeah, yeah, of and course you are. Arabian Ranches 3 hands over this month. Are you saying well. that as an investor? No. Are you saying that as a, <laughs> I do, so I've seen the video that you sent me of the, the is it Elan? Elan, is yes. it? Elan. Elan, yeah. And I've seen it, and you can just see the quality difference from the new villas to let's say the Springs or anything, uh, Ranches 2 or 1, they're really understanding what a customer wants. Yeah. I think the fact that we were shooting in Tel Al Gaff last week and just being there, you're literally sort of like 10 minutes from the heart of Dubai, yeah. and then you've got a, a man-made beach slash lake that you can swim in. Did you get it? I didn't, didn't, have, didn't have my cosy. <laughs> Do you know what's mad? So what I've noticed with new builds, I don't know if you say so in the UK and U, EU they want to stop the sale of petrol cars by 2030. Mm -hmm. So new cars can't be sold by 2030. I'm not too sure what it is in the UAE. But all these like places, there's no electric car chargers. There you How go. are they going to kind of get to this? Five thousand dirhams you put on your house, guy. That's what the it is. I think. Yeah, I think. I think, that, yeah. I think and the next stop. thing will be Capu will have mobile. Yeah, chargers. Electric chargers as well. Superchargers. There you go, mate. It's your next there business you idea. You're done. There we go. I'm off. Right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Until Cheers. next week. Cool. Thank See you. you.